David takes down Goliath. The Temple women's lacrosse team knocks off number 12 Towson at home. Plus, the men's soccer team pulls off an upset of its own early in the season. Our sports update is live and it starts right now. Welcome back to Studio 3 for another edition of Al Sports Update. I'm Jackson Neal, joined alongside Dom Gillespie. We have a jam-packed show for you today filled with upsets, early exits, and everything in between. But we'll start today's show with the lacrosse team's game against number 12, Towson. Heading into this game, Temple was coming off its first loss of the season, a 19-11 blowout to cross-city rival Drexel. And the Owls had to bounce back quickly as they took on the 12th-ranked Towson Tigers at Howard Field. How about this sight for sore eyes? This was the first game in almost exactly one year with fans back in the stands at the Temple Sports Complex. Friends and family in attendance. To the game we go, where the Tigers looked like a ranked team early as they scored first with this goal by Carrie Thornton. It would not take long at all for Temple to respond. Here, Megan Hoffman scores her first of back-to-back -back goals. It was part of a five-goal run by the Owls to jump out in front five to one early on in the first half. And keep in mind, it's not just offense for Temple. Here, their defense gets a big block off an eight meter shot by Towson. Later in the game we go, the Cherry and White get a shot of their own, and it's Bridget Whitaker who converts one of her two goals on the day. And with that, Temple gets the 12 to eight win. This is the highest ranked win in Temple lacrosse history and its first victory over a top 25 opponent since 2018. Now, crazy upset part two, the men's soccer team trying to snap a three-game losing streak against the second-ranked team in country, SMU. Let's pick it up in the first half. Temple with some promising positioning in the Mustang zone. Mike Eigendahl passes it to Karani. He settles the ball. Santiago Majewski gives it a go here. That's saved, but Eigendahl gets it back. Bingo, one nothing. Owls leading early in this one. SMU tries to answer. Header is no good. Nicholas Hartman can't get control of it. SMU scores the goal, but goalie interference is the call. Temple stays ahead in this one. Karani again, he has a step, he's inside the box, down he goes, the call is made, it's a penalty kick for the Owls. Pierre Cayette will take it for Temple, and not many soccer stars will miss that one, especially the AAC Defensive Player of the Week. As a matter of fact, the Owls swept all three categories for Player of the Week, defensive, offensive, goaltender, all wear cherry and white, as the soccer team pulls off one of the most improbable wins in school history as they take down SMU by a final of two to nothing. Was, was just said how proud I was of, of their effort. Um, again, I think, you know, games aren't, games aren't decided on rankings. Games are decided by players. And certainly I will take you know, the guys in our locker room any day of the week. And uh, I think we have a very talented team that is learning how to win games, uh, which is important. Uh, but certainly, you know, with that requires a focused and complete effort. And I thought that we did that today. So I'm proud that we took a step uh, in realizing maybe some of the potential that we have. While we are on the subject of upsets, let's take a look back on some of the biggest ones in Temple history, three of them coming within the past 14 months. Back in 2000, the late legend John Chaney fired the Owls up to take down the best team in college basketball, the Cincy Bearcats. Back in 2020, the fencing team upset the best team in the nation, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. For reference, the Owls were ranked fifth that season. And within the last week, the men's soccer team stunned SMU in shutout fashion, and the women's lacrosse team did some foiling of their own against the 12th ranked team in the country. And now with those upsets in mind, we want to ask you which one is the most impressive. Hop over to our Twitter at Al Sports Update and vote for your favorite. While the basketball and fencing team upset the number one team in the nation, my vote would have to go to that soccer game. Temple came in with a losing record on a three-game losing streak against the number two team in the nation and beat them not one, but two to nothing. The basketball and fencing teams had top 25 rankings all ready to go along with their upsets. All in all, some classic matches for Temple. But let us know what you think. That's at Al Sports Update on Twitter. Now to the basketball side of things. The AAC tournament is kicking off as we speak. Temple is taking on USF, the ninth and eighth seed, respectively. Temple's odds to win are slim, but let's take a look around the rest of the American to see how the tournament might shape out. 
to help me with this, we bring on courts and session anchor, Sage Hurley. Sage, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Dom. Sage, you obviously have your Wichita States and Houston's other conference, but let's have a little fun, shall we? Who's a dark horse to win the AAC tournament? Not so much of a dark horse, but my pick is Memphis. They already beat Wichita State by 20, and they lost at the buzzer to Houston in their last regular season game. Hardaway's Tigers and their top-tier defense are absolutely capable of bringing home the AAC tournament trophy. My, my bid would have to go to UCF. They took the number one seed Wichita State to overtime earlier this season. But let's have a moment of optimism, shall we, on the Temple side of things. They have a young roster, and McKee will be in his third season as a head coach. Could next year be the year the Owls make the tournament? I can't say with confidence that there will be a complete turnaround from this season, but I can say this. Each year, this team becomes more and more McKee's team, with young players establishing their role on the court and great recruits coming in like three-star guard Isaiah Miller and Zach Hicks from across the river at Camden Catholic. There's a bright future ahead for the Temple Owls. Thank you so much for coming on, Sage. Thanks, Dom. The men's season hangs in the balance as we speak. We figured it'd be a good time to announce the AAC awards given to three Owls this season. Damian Dunn was awarded first team all rookie. The freshman was the Owls leading scorer for a majority of the season before his knee injury. Caleb Battle got a third team all conference spot. It took him a little while to get his footing this season, but went on a tear his last three games of the regular season, averaging 25 points per game. That's a bright future for the sophomore transfer. And finally, senior captain JP Mormon ended the year with some hard well at hardware as he takes on the sportsmanship award for the AAC. It's been about a year since sports were first impacted by the COVID-19 virus, and during that time, life has completely changed. For athletes, the virus has led to countless cancellations and postponements, but also changed their life away from competition. Al Sports Update's Ricky Turner has more. Long road trips and hours of practice and studying have taken its toll on college athletes. According to a survey done by the NCAA, student athletes taking fully virtual classes were one and a half to two times more likely to experience mental health concerns. AAC Student Athlete Advisory Committee is continuing to focus on mental health by using the hashtag Powerful Minds in hopes to end the stigma related to seeking help. They have to be equipped to deal with personal pressures, the the uh, demands of, of balancing a full-time class schedule and 20 hours of practice and, and potential travel. I think the unknown is uh, a pretty big stressor. The unknown has unleashed havoc on the OWL schedule. Across its many programs, Temple has at 14 games canceled or postponed due to COVID-related issues. Stress for a student athlete is unimaginable. It is important to be aware of the mental health services that Temple Athletics has to offer. And it's not just at the conference level either. TUL is a service that helps student athletes with mental health issues. If you want to schedule a meeting with TUL, they offer anonymous referral forms found on the Temple Athletic website. Reporting for Owl Sports Update, I'm Ricky Turner. And with that, it's now time to take our first break of the show. Coming up, we'll take you to Fort Worth, Texas, where the women's basketball team competed in the AAC tournament. Plus, we'll also find out how the golf team fared in their first tournament of the season. Also, we'll take a look at the cheer squad. They haven't been able to be in person for basketball games this season, but that hasn't stopped them from providing energy at the Leocora Center. We'll explain when Al Sports Update returns in 90 seconds. Welcome back to Owl Sports Update. NCAA tournament odds are bleak for the Owls, so they need to win the conference if they want in. First quarter action here, Asana Alexander has at the top of the key, finds Mia Davis. That's good for two points. The forward played 39 minutes in this one. On the other side of the ball, Diana Jones will finish that one through the contact, and she had seven points on the night. Here's Tulane again with the ball. Jones with the pull-up jumper as Tulane pulls away going into the half. Turnovers plagued both teams throughout the entire game. The Green Wave and the Owls combined for almost 50 on the night, but Tulane led in almost every other stat. Field goal percentage, three-point percentage, free throw percentage, assists, steals, and blocks, and in the end points. 
Tulane led by as much as 20 on the night, and after the first quarter, there was no looking back. Temple ends its season at exactly 500 with 11 wins and 11 losses as they fall to Tulane 83-73 to to end the year. The Owls did not end the season the way they wanted, but there's still a lot of recognition last night and throughout the season to go around. Against Tulane, Jaysha Clinton led the Owls with a game-high 22 points. To go along with her scoring, she also added an impressive eight assists and left it all on the defensive side of the floor with five steals. An absurd stat line from a freshman, might I add. On the season, Clinton averaged 14.4 points per game and 4.1 assists per game. So overall, it was a very productive first season on broad. And Jaysha, hopefully, has many more to come. Now, let's expand our focus and take a look at the AAC tournament bracket as a whole. Up at the top of the bracket, Temple came into its matchup against Tulane as the number five seed. The Green Wave ended up moving on to play top seeded South Florida where they narrowly lost 51 to 47. That win propelled the Bulls into the conference championship where they'll play Central Florida. The second seeded Golden Knights easily advanced past the Houston Cougars 61 to 39 in the semifinals on Wednesday. The championship game will be this Thursday night. And with the conclusion of this year's season, it marks the end of Mia Davis' fourth year at Temple. While she will be using her extra year of eligibility from COVID to come back next season, we wanted to take a look at her career so far. In her four years on Broad, Davis has only missed two of Temple's 114 games played. In those 100 plus games, she's averaged 16 and a half points to go along with nearly nine rebounds per game. Shooting 45% from the field, Davis has established herself as a threat to opposing defenses, leading to countless shots at the line. Her 412 free throws made is the all-time record at Temple. These record-breaking stats have led to plenty of accolades for Davis throughout her career. This season, for the third straight year, she's been named to the first team All-American Athletic Conference roster. In 2020, she was a U.S. Basketball Writers Association All-American Honorable Mention and named Philadelphia Big Five Player of the Year. Last season, Davis was also a top 10 finalist for the Cheryl Miller Award presented to the nation's best small forward. Now with still another year of eligibility, Davis will no doubt be adding more hardware to her trophy case come next season. Since the pandemic broke out, it has always been a priority for the NCAA to promote a health and safe environment for games. One drawback for teams is not having the support of fans and cheerleaders on the sidelines, but the Owls have found a way to bring the energy elsewhere. OSU's Emily Cochrane has more. On game days, dancing, cheering, and flipping on the court of Leah Chorus used to be normal for the Temple Spirit squads. Due to the pandemic, the Owls are not only missing their fans, but their courtside support as well. Because of the things we've missed out on, we've learned to really embrace what we do have. Both squads have the routines pre-recorded, playing for the Owls on the court and for the fans at home. Athletics really wanted to incorporate us in the games as well. We wanted to be involved however we could. Home games still include Jumbotron performances. But for those at home, the best way to experience game day is Temple's Hoot From Home broadcast. This experience takes all the game day action from the Leacor Center and brings it to the comfort of your own home. We have been recording our dances for the basketball games in Leacor Center. It kind of brings, you know, the crowd there almost. 59 owls performing for up to three hours in an empty arena. It's not perfect, but it's well worth it. I think it's the best that we can do under the circumstances that we're given. When we get to record for games, those are the days that I look forward to most. It's almost like getting ready for game day again. For now, the performances remain virtual, but both teams hope to be back on the sidelines next football season, right where their support belongs. Reporting from the Leo Core Center, I'm Emily Cochran, Al Sports Update. While the weather may have turned for the better this week, a harsh winter has made the start of the season tough for the Owls golf team. Snow has made it difficult to spend time on the course, forcing Temple to get creative with their practice time. Owl Sports Update's Thomas Nemec explains. Golf in Philly in February. Not exactly a perfect marriage. The Owl season is underway, but with snow still melting and the local course is still muddy, the team didn't actually get on the golf course until its first tournament at the Palmetto Country Club in South Carolina. In practices, they've been regulated to the driving range. It's difficult to kind of find your groove 
uh, mentally for me, at least that's where I, you know, I felt I struggled the most. So I think now that we've got those kind of three rounds under our belt, we're going to have a couple extra days to, to, to get into the, into the zone for this event. No courses in the surrounding area have been open for the golf team to practice on. So as a result, the players have had to get a little creative practicing at home, just like this. That way, they make sure their short game is up to par. Rolling the ball over uh, your uh, your fastest carpet in your house. We did a lot of that. Played a lot of mini golf in the house. So, I remember when for the first like two months of quarantine when it started, I was hitting balls off a old piece of carpet in my driveway into a net where all our cars were parked. And if I missed the net, it was going to hit my mom's car. <laughs> that was our life for the first like two months, just trying to keep keep our games in the right place. The Owls have been steadily improving as they play in more tournaments, finishing 9th out of 16th this past week. Next up, the team heads back down south to Williamsburg, Virginia to play in the Golden Horseshoe Intercollegiate Tournament. This is Tom Nemec, Owl Sports Update. And now it's time for us to take another time out. Coming up, we'll head back to men's soccer and the international flavor that helped the Owls win their upset of SMU. Plus, we'll talk about how the gymnastics team had a big day in more ways than one, and the cross-country team travels south. Hear all about it when we come back. Welcome back to Owl Sports Update. Following the men's soccer team's upset, there has now been eight different players to record a point. Of those eight, six were born outside of the United States. I called up with a couple players on the team to find out how it's been adjusting to a new country. They know it's Spin a globe and you'll probably land on a country where someone from the Temple men's soccer team is from. With players from France, Jamaica, Israel and everywhere in between, there are nine different countries represented on the Owls roster this year. I remember the day very clearly because it was, um, I'm from Tel Aviv, Israel, which is an um, odd place. I came to um, Philly, it was uh, January something. It was snowing here, it was um, in the middle of the winter. It was the first time that I've seen snow. Adjusting to a new culture is something that all of Temple's international players have to go through, but it's worth it for the unique opportunity that American college soccer provides. In my country, the Netherlands, uh, school and soccer is not combined. So it's separate. So or you focus on soccer or you focus on your school. But it's hard to do both. I found out about America that they have like college soccer and you can do a degree with a scholarship and all those things. And that sounded pretty good. Regardless of the differences of where they're originally from, the game of soccer connects them all. I am happy that I, I came to Temple to play with so many different cultures, so many different languages. But at the end of the day, you know, the language of soccer is like universal, I think. As they showed this weekend, it's a language that all Temple players are fluent in. It was right here at the Temple Sports Complex where the Owls beat number two ranked SMU 2-0. The two players that scored for Temple internationally born players Mike Eigendahl and Pierre Caillé. The Owls now set their sights on getting back to 500 and into contention for the AAC tournament when they travel to Oklahoma to take on Tulsa this Saturday. The Owls came into this gymnastics meet winless in their past 13 attempts, and they are starving for that first win of the year. Tori Edwards kicking things off on the vault. Overall, the Owls score a 48.9, which is the seventh highest in program history. Ariana Castrense led the way with a 9.85. To the beam we go. Freshmen carry the rotation this time around. Brooke Donabedian won the event with a 9.85. Renee Shugman added a 9.8. 2-5 of her own, and Temple still leads. The Owls had a miscue on the bars, but still notched a 48.225. And on the floor, the Owls have been spectacular. Edwards, Roland, and Castrense all notched 9.875s, and were just .025 away from their best score ever. Temple takes down Long Island for its first win of the year, as the postseason is just under two weeks away. In a dual action meet against LIU, the gymnastics team recorded a season high score of 195.4 on Sunday, sending its six seniors out on a high note. Temple swept all five events led by junior Ariana Kostrense as she won the all around with a score of 39.325. After the meet, the Owls not only celebrated their win, but their class of 2021 as well. The senior class is made up of two assistants, Erica Fuse and Monica Cervedio, and four gymnasts, Tori Edwards, Delaney Garin, Faith Leary, and Jordan Oster. You'll have another chance to catch these seniors on Friday in a try meet at 6 p.m. and a quad meet at 4 p.m. on Sunday, both of them at Towson. 
Over to the cross country team, where the men's side just wrapped up their season down in Florida. The Owls competed at Florida State University in the school's last chance meet and came in fourth out of five schools. The Cherry and White recorded 117 team points in the 8K race. Senior Christian Jensi was the first Temple runner to cross the line as he finished at 20th overall. And now it's time to take our last break of the day. We still have a couple more sports to get to on the other side. Yes, sir, Jackson. On the other side, we'll talk some field hockey as they were in action twice against Villanova this past weekend. We'll be back in 90 seconds. Welcome back to Owl Sports Update. It's been a busy offseason for the football team. With transfers both coming and going from North Broad, the roster is going to look a lot different next fall. However, there will be some players who have even more experience than usual. Owl Sports Update's Lindsay Mopper explains. You want the silver lining? COVID has won for players on the Temple football team. It's giving them an extra year. I just saw it as more opportunity. Less than 2% of all NCAA football players make it into the NFL. And those who do only play an average of two and a half years. So this extra year of eligibility gives players more time to make life decisions. I mean, the NFL is a, a dream come true to everybody, but uh, you see the percentages. Everybody doesn't, isn't able to stay in the NFL for too long. So it just gives me more time just to learn everything and just see what I want to do. The team still does not know the number of players who are going to take advantage of that extra year of football. But for those who do, there is a significant educational benefit. I think it's truly a blessing in disguise. Uh, being able to go and get my master's degree is going to be something that's really important to me and it's going to help, I know, because at the end of the day, football is going to end. And it's not uncommon for these athletes to graduate in three and a half years or less, which means some of these guys might even earn two degrees while under scholarship. The master's degree gives you a lot of leverage for when you're applying for jobs and just life after football. Whether these athletes are preparing for the NFL or earning a master's degree or both, this COVID year of eligibility is available for more players than it's ever been. Reporting for Al Sports Update, I'm Lindsay Mopper. Thank you so much, Lindsay. The field hockey team was in action this Saturday and Sunday against Villanova. They won the contest on Saturday, one to nothing, and we're hoping for a similar type of game on Sunday, but it was not that easy. The Wildcats won a revenge, and they got it in a conference overtime thriller. It was a beautiful Sunday afternoon at the Temple Sports Complex. The Owls came into this one 2-4 and four on the year and were in need of a win. They got the scoring going in the first quarter on this goal by Cassie Romachuk. That is the first goal of the freshman's young career. one nothing Owls. Villanova would come out of the half firing with a goal in the 35th minute as it is knotted up 1-1. Temple controlled the ball most of the game and had nine penalty corners, but scored on zero of them. Take a look at this one. An ideal chance to take the lead late in the fourth. Will not go, and this match will go to overtime. Villanova off the corner here, settled at the top of the key. First shot will not go, but the rebound will find the back of the net, and that will do it for this one. The Wildcats take home the victory 2-1. to one. And with that, we wrap up this week's edition of Al Sports Update. Yes, but fret not, Al fans. Stay tuned to our Twitter for a new edition of Courts in Session this Friday. Next week on Tuesday, Al Access Pass. An Al Sports Update with Ray Dunn and Courtney Murphy next Thursday. For Jackson Neal, I am Dom Gillespie. Have a great day, everyone.